This is gonna be a little bit more of a serious topic, but you know, we'll make light of it as we can, as we go. If we were to split all of the relationships, friendships and romantic relationships of people on the left and people on the right, down the middle, I wonder which side would have more toxic and abusive traits. Because honestly, right now, most of the people on the left or left leaning are acting like an abusive boyfriend or girlfriend. It really takes a sick kind of person to spend four years calling you a traitor and a racist and worse, and then say that they'll stop and accept you if you just agree Agree to everything they want. This is toxic relationship shit. Been there, done that. For those of you who don't know, I've been in at least four, maybe borderline five abusive relationships. None of them were physical. They were mainly abusive mentally, emotionally, and verbally. Mainly emotionally, I would say. Um, it fucked me up real good. Uh, I'm on Prozac to this day because of it. I've been in therapy and I studied the psychology of all of this and I've learned a lot. And I can see the red flags and the warning signs fairly well at this point. But just to be sure that I'm correct on this, I have a few therapists and psychologist friends of mine here today to show you all the ways the tolerant left is actually being extremely abusive. I found this cute little bubble graphic on Reddit to make it a little bit easier for us. Let's just see how many of these these people who I claim to be loving um, are guilty of. Let's just go. Okay. Number one, stop seeing friends and family. It is all about control. Hello lockdowns. People that are abusive want to disconnect you from everything and everyone. I can't even begin to tell you how many ex friends of mine that were fellow content creators have unfollowed me and have since posted videos about me saying how horrible of a person I am, even though a lot of them secretly agree with me, I'm just saying. All because they are afraid of the woke mob. They are afraid of the actual abusers. And in a strange way, I actually have pity for these people because I know that they are allowing themselves to be controlled and abused. They want nothing to do with me because the left believes in guilty by association. If I am a horrible person and these people are still friends with me, then they too are horrible people. So they will distance themselves and alienate anyone who who disagrees with them and make themselves go further and further into an echo chamber, very similar to an abusive girlfriend or boyfriend. Abusers want to isolate you. They want to prevent you from having allies who might encourage you to stand up to their abuse, who might help you resist their distorted view of reality. They want to prevent you from hearing any opinions other than their own. Their view of reality is a tiny, thin little bubble that anyone can poke. And so they need desperately to prevent you from having anyone, any other opinions, anybody else who might say, you know, this is kind of crazy because it is. Number two, they won't let you go out without permission. Going to Chick-fil-A, you're a bigot. Seen hanging out with somebody that's on the other side, you're a fucking traitor. You're a racist traitor. Leaving your house during lockdowns? Grandma killer. Number five, they control the finances and will not allow you to work. Remember all those times when the media did their best to cancel people and get them fired from their jobs? This isn't an abusive at all. Typical abusive behavior. Number six, they control what you watch, read, and say. Why are you following Arielle Scarcella on Twitter? She's a bigot. She's a turf and a bigot. People People have literally come for me for liking somebody's tweets that I might not even agree with. Sometimes I just want to like somebody's tweets because I want to read the article that they posted later on and I don't have the time to do it now. Either way, why are you trying to obsessively control everything that I like, everyone that I follow, and anything that I comment on? Number seven, they monitor everything you do. Echo chambers. Obsessively looking at somebody's liked tweets, telling people who they are and are not allowed to follow, regardless if they agree with their stances or not. These are the people who spend hours looking at your social media checking out your likes, screenshotting what you tweet or say. If you block them on Twitter, they start new anon accounts so they can stalk you. They clearly have a strong desire to control you. They seem to think they own you or that you owe them something. And these are not healthy behaviors. People who do this need to ask themselves, what is missing in your life that you need to obsess so much about other people and what they choose to do with their lives? Number eight, they punish you for breaking the rules. Nothing you ever do or say will ever be good enough for these people. We're gonna call this constant goalpost shifting. Also the rules for thee, but not for me thing. That's a thing too. Number 10, they don't allow you to question it. If you question the new leftist law, you are a racist, a transphobe, a bigot, a white supremacist, a Nazi. Give me another name, somebody out there who isn't aware of their privilege, okay? The I'm always right is a super toxic trait that is specifically meant to influence how and what you think. It's a very slow stripping away of your individual identity and how they think that you should be rather than how you actually are. No wonder why all these super far progressive lefties 
things look the same. They take away their individual thought processes and their identities and somehow because of that wind up all looking, thinking, acting, being the exact same person. There will be consequences even in the book White Fragility if you question any part of Robin DiAngelo's 150 page racist confession, then you will simply be told, well, that's just your white fragility showing. And it's no wonder these people all look the same because they very literally see themselves as part of a larger group rather than for their individual attributes. People don't think this is a cult, but I don't know what else you can call something when you are stripping away the elements of someone's individual identity and forcing them to adhere to an ideology, even if it goes against common sense. Number 13, gaslighting. Pretty common tactic they use on the left, but somehow they manage to spin it and say that I'm the one gaslighting them. Rewriting events and erasing history to convince you that things happened in a certain way when in fact they did not. Remember when they successfully conditioned people to believe that black trans women are the reason that we have gay rights today? That they in fact started the Stonewall riots and if it wasn't for them we would be nowhere. And therefore we must always be obedient and grateful for them. Meanwhile, none of this is actually true. Link in the description to that video if you wanna know what actually happened at Stonewall. And another more current example is in the recent wave of anti-Asian hate crimes. Now, hate crimes, of course, are never good and never should be condoned, but if you listen to the left, they would have you believe that the increase of anti-Asian hate crimes is a direct result of Donald Trump and white supremacy. However, here are some statistics from the FBI. Though black people comprise 13% of the population, they commit 27.5% of all violent crimes against Asian Americans in 2018. And while whites comprise 62% of the population, they commit 24% of the crimes against Asians. But they want to convince you that this is all because of white supremacy and because Donald Trump said that COVID-19 came from China. Number 14, they dismiss your opinions. Um, you're white, so your opinion is invalid. You're cis, you can't have any say in trans issues. Shaming you into not talking about your experience, making you feel selfish for doing so. Number 15, the victim card. Blaming everyone other than themselves for the issues that they have. They twist their problems to be a result of your actions, rather than acknowledging that they are, in fact, the actual problem. And if things go wrong, it is all, obviously, it's all your fault. Blaming you for their actions. For instance, pushing back against my assertions will cause me to self-harm. You're literally killing trans people. It's amazing to me how many people who are abusive and damaging, traumatizing, harming others, when they get called on their behavior, when they get confronted, when they get challenged, their first response is, well, I'm a victim. I've been harmed. I've been abused. We have in a strange, creepy, disturbing way created a social system right now that incentivizes and rewards and reinforces people identifying as a victim. Because if you identify as a victim, then you're not responsible for your behavior. And that's troubling to me. It's frightening. It's concerning the degree to which being a victim makes you not accountable. Because now all the accountability is on the people who hurt you. You. And if they're a victim, then all the accountability is on the people that hurt them. And it's this never-ending cas cascade where nobody is responsible for anything, so long as everybody is a victim. These are the people that will blame everyone but themselves for anything that happens. If things go wrong, it's always your fault, not their fault. For instance, they will bait you and bait you, lie about you, twist your words out of context. If you snap back, you're in the wrong. Uh, you've harmed them, you're being mean, they're the innocent victim. And there's no sense of the bigger picture for these people of, of accountability for what they contributed to the dynamic. So there's just an automatic assumption that they must be a powerless victim. At its worst, that's just cynical manipulation. But even at its best, it's still denial about personal responsibility and agency. And that's not good. Some bonus abusive traits. Your boundaries don't matter. Only their needs do. Karl Marx wrote that philosophers have only tried to interpret the world in a variety of ways. The point, however, is to change it. Now, if we take this as an operating principle in the activist left, we see that change is the most important part of any given activity, conversation, 
or relationship. It doesn't matter what word they put for that change. We know that their motives are to achieve a goal. And in order to get people on board with this change, you need a common story. And it happens to be more expedient when you're trying to control the narrative to limit stories that go against that. So instead of arguing point by point with any given narrative or thought, they kind of section that off. They cordon that thought off as bad or those voices as bad. These people who are after control extend their bounds of power further and further and further into other people. One thing that we see within LGBT discussions or within the activist parts of these discussions, these really odd behaviors about controlling who people sleep with, saying that if you are attracted to this person and not attracted to this other person or other group, that decision to not be attracted to something is somehow a form of bigotry, which is both silly on the surface and authoritarian in its roots. Once you can control people's sex lives, you have them basically by the gonads, more or less literally. That is one current and extreme example of the erosion of boundaries that's going on under the name of activism. And as those boundaries are eroded, the private becomes more and more public. The personal becomes more and more political, so that eventually there is no more personal. There is only the political. Once everything becomes political, everything becomes about power, and power is all about control. Projection, yes. Being the literal thing that they are accusing you of. Being racist, transphobic, sexist, misogynistic, all these things. The tactics used to manipulate people are wide and varied, but it basically comes down to always destabilizing the opponent. Take, for example, being called defensive. You're in an argument with somebody, and then they attack you in some way. Then you defend yourself against that attack. Then they call you defensive. And then you start defending yourself from the accusation of being defensive, whatever that actually means. And what's no longer happening is an actual argument about an issue. You are destabilized and that other person is advancing ground. When everything is about control and everything is about power, all these different tactics serve the end of redistributing the control of the narrative, the control of action, the control of behavior to those who have claimed the higher moral authority. Please spread this video like wildfire, share it on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever have you. This message needs to get out because the number of abusive relationships, friendships are multiplying by the day. As somebody who has experienced multiple of them and is a little bit fucked up in the head from them for life, I don't want to see this happening anymore. And now it's not only happening in romantic relationships, but in friendships, in businesses, um, in in political discourse, it's it's not cute. Can we just spread this video, please? Other than that, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up. Thank you to everybody that contributed to it. And I will see you guys back here in a few days with a brand new video. Make sure to subscribe if you are not already. And I'll see you then.